Hello, everybody. It's lovely to see you all and welcome to the launch of Body Shell Girl by Rose Hunter. It's actually a real pleasure to be publishing this book. But before we start, I would just like to uh, do an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their custodianship of the lands and waterways. The lands on which Spinifex offices are situated are Juru, Banarong, Wurundjeri, Wadawurrung, Aora and Mungna. We also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. So, uh, thank you again for all being here. Uh, and my name is Susan Hawthorne, and along with Renata Klein, uh, publisher at Spinifex Press. Um, so, the order of things this evening is that Sally Breen will speak first, followed by Simone Watson and then Rose Hunter will speak and I hope read some of her poems. So just to introduce Sally first, Dr. Sally Breen is the author of The Casuals in published 2011, winner of the Varuna Harper Collins Manuscript Prize and Atomic City, which was published in 2013, which was shortlisted for the book of the year Queensland Literary Awards in 2014. Her short form work has been published widely in Overland, Griffith University, Mianjin, The Guardian, London, The Age, Best Australian Stories, The Asia Literary Review, The Conversation and Sydney Review of Books. She's worked as an associate editor at the Griffith Review and is executive uh, director of the Asia Pacific Writers and Translators, and is a senior lecturer in creative writing at Griffith University. And just to make things move along nice and smoothly, I'll also introduce Simone Watson. Uh, Simone has been uh, very active uh, against prostitution. She is a survivor activist. She's also director uh, Nordic Equality Model Australia. She's a former human rights delegate for Amnesty International, and she has a very fine article in Prostitution Narratives, which is this book, uh, which was published in 2016. Um, I think I'll leave uh, introducing Rose until after Sally and Simone have spoken. So Sally, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Susan, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me to um, help launch Rose's wonderful book, um, Body Shell Girl. Um, I was pretty blown away um, by this book um, for a number of reasons, which I'll get to soon. Um, first of all, though, I want to congratulate you, Rose, um, for your bravery in sharing this story, but also for your talent in bringing that story to life so vividly. Uh, also, I must say kudos to Spinifex, um, Susan and all the team for publishing this book and many others which challenge all the dominant paradigms in the literary space. Uh, that the space to do that is shrinking and Spinifex is always um, been at the forefront of this. Um, so thank you very much for bringing this book into the world. It is a really special book. It's layered and creative and complicated. On one level, it's fairly simple if we approach it as a confessional or a delivery of one woman's story where the subject matter is pretty clear. We know that Rose has created this first novel inspired in her own words by her radioactive journals, which she kept in the first two years of a decade long stint in the sex industry in Canada. In this way, the book 
I guess, joins a conversation, a context with other books about the sex industry that explore it from different points of view. And there's a lot to say about this highly contested arena. For me though, Rose's book stands out or stands apart in a way from what might be considered a, a kind of subgenre of its own for a few reasons. The first is that for me, it avoids what can sometimes be a kind of titillation, whether that's intentional or not, that often inhabits books that are related to either prostitution or stripping and the associated industries. And often that position is developed not only in the text itself, but in the marketing and also in the reception of those books by the media and, and sometimes by audiences. And so in this way, it's unlike anything else I've read. Um, perhaps um, it reminded me in some ways um, of other books, but it takes away that confusion by focusing on Rose's body beyond or beside that of a male gaze. And that's not easy to do, especially in this space. To expose so vividly that male misogynist fantasy, as I say in my blurb for the book, for what it is. What struck me though, is that Rose's remove is not cold or clinical to offer, a, um, I guess, a, a, a counterpoint to what I was mentioning before. The book is still really sensorial, highly sensorial and lived. And the position is really powerful because she never relinquishes herself to that point of view of the male gaze. So the subversion is so powerfully present, both in the critique of the industry, um, but it's not just a position or an opinion, it's embodied. And that comes alive in how that embodiment is embedded within the verse in the book. When I was reading it, I felt as if it was growing over me. And I was drawn into this world instead of setting apart or being set apart and watching it and observing it and judging it. And this is what I mean when I say in my blurb that trauma can sometimes destroy a narrative or it can create a firestorm. Just because a story deserves to be told or should be told doesn't mean the writer is capable necessarily of telling it well, especially when it's associated with lived experience and trauma. For obvious reasons, because trauma can sometimes be so debilitating that the ability to create art, to lift the book from being reduced to its subject matter is null and void. It's dangerous territory in this sense, given the impact, the exploration, all that manipulation and reinterpretation that's required in order to produce art, that can be too much, you know. The narrative can sometimes fall away, become victim to it, or it's ineffective from a critical point of view. And that's not the case here. And perhaps Rose is going to speak to this and I hope she will at some point tonight about that intersection between trauma and artistry, because this is a work of art, but how do we make art out of something that hurts? It's a really strange kind of impulse for a, a writer to not only have, but to manipulate. And 
I guess, Rose, that's my question to you. Um, and I hope um, we can perhaps talk about that a little bit um, without, you know, romanticizing or reducing the artistry to the subject. And I think that that's what's so powerful in this book. I was going to read um, one of my favorite pieces in the book, but I'm very hesitant to be the first reader of a poem in this collection. Um, but, and perhaps Rose is going to um, read this poem and it's called, Why Are We Girls? And to me, it's a really stunning um, example of some of the points that I've been raising. Um, so maybe Rose um, can read that or you probably, there's so many that you can choose from. But once again, thanks very much for um, sharing this with us and congratulations. And um, I'll now hand it on. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sally. Um, my name is Simone Watson and it's a, such an honor for me to be here with you all and part of this launch of this extraordinary book. I can't think of a book that I would rather do a launch for. I, I haven't actually met Rose before and I wasn't aware that this collection was coming together when I was sent the manuscript. Um, but I think maybe going on the back of what Sally was talking about with creating the art out of trauma and how you've managed to do this, You'll have to correct me if I'm getting ahead of myself, Rose, later. We haven't had a conversation about this and I'm very excited about it. But the way that you managed, because a part of in, when I was reading this, because of having been in the same, in the prostitution system, I noticed my body and my mind wanting to leap away. And then I was noticing how you brought the words back to the page so and the doorways feature a lot ro uh, rooms feature a lot so you kept me engaged with it without going into into a kind of trauma I, I just think it's incredible just from a simple line from this like on page four the room echoed the finality snapping shut but snap out of it I'd try to get I'd try again now you hadn't, you were just looking in the ads, you weren't in full on prostitution yet. But right there, I felt in me the finality of making that decision. I'm not going to use the word choice, the decision. I felt something in me, and I can kind of see you smiling with that. So that's from Portal that opens the book. Um, and then we see that again in Just in the Room um, on page 13. Um, therefore, pause, observe. I had that mind waiting in the wings like that near the hinge. Also knew how running the mind was a way for the body to stay still, stay in the room. So you've connected all the, inter the intervening paragraphs with where we started. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I like, the book looks like this, right? So like, I was thinking we should have, um, got together and said, who's reading what? But I just got, um, sorry for being so excited. You think this was really wonderful, this prostitution system, right? But it's just that I'm, I am excited because this, this joins the canon of um, women's resistance against the prostitution system. And this resistance has been around since the invention of patriarchy or not long after. But before we, in this society, enslaved men, it practised slavery on women. This is how the prostitution system was born and why it's not been around, you know, since forever. It's been around as long as slavery has. And, and, and I think that, you know, maybe in the broader fem, uh, consciousness of society, this isn't spoken of enough. But... Anyway, um, I, of course, I was there. Is sometimes I went into like an overwhelm as a as a mother. I, I just went. Um, there's another one of your. I'm sorry that I'm taking a bit of time here. Sorry. No. 
Okay, this is part of things get messed up pretty quickly. Okay, so deep breath, think of that lake, jump in. What kind of answers are offered in a box-like room? Again, we've got this room that you have to keep yourself in. And I think this is a huge part of prostitution that, that isn't spoken about. Just keeping yourself in there is half the job done. Um, but there's just, this really affected me. No, I can't see that, but I can see me in bird's eye view, a barn, swallows say, mud nest flush with ceiling, hair, feathers, grasses, moss, peeling. So it's beautiful. You've got this imagery of being out in nature, but actually you're trying to escape from yourself. And, and I think with the trajectory of this book, you so beautifully encapsulate um, um, it's it kind of got a syncopated rhythm to it, but you you take us from, or sometimes we're reading laundry lists. It's almost like it's being read out starkly, you know, like that, where the mind has to go. Um, and then we go back into the emotion of it. This is the humanity of it all. And um, I suppose I should start winding up. I know, but um, the, there's a poem here called Rick, and uh, no, before I get to that, I just want to thank you for your humour in Snow Peas and page 21-22. And I say humour, you know, advisedly, but it, it's not knowing what a full service is, but also how ridiculous the conversations are. And I'm just so grateful to you for putting this in. When you're talking to Zoo and she's saying what you, you know, telling you the rules and she says, and don't do full service ever. Don't even think about it as if you would, like if you knew what it was in the first place, right? Well, I gazed back at her waiting for further information. She gazed back, her mouth flew open, her fingernails biffed the top of my head, but gently like a caress. Sex, she shrieked, don't do sex. Um, I don't care how hot he is. And I was just like, so I'm reading that and just like I'm laughing at how ridiculous it is. But I did observe that pimps or the lady madams, as we might like to call them, do the same thing, I think, that the general public do kind of unwittingly. And that is assume that, that prostitution is some kind of sexuality that we have. It's mm. astonishing to me that we still carry this myth of some kind of moral deviance in the prostituted woman or that, but it was interesting that she was playing out that role. And I noticed that happened too, that um, that that they would do this. So you you got me with this, this humour and, and, and uh, I was laughing at how ridiculous it was. Um, and, and then, of course, you kicked out of Canada. And then, you know, these terrible things that I won't go into that happened with police and with this guy. And you're on the side of the road in a foreign country. And I got out my umbrella. I got my umbrella out of my backpack, thinking how absurd. The one thing I was prepared for was rain. <laughs> and just quickly, I was... I was sort of drawn to read a bit of The Prostitution of Sexuality by Kathleen Barry. And it goes into the harm of personal choice politics and campaigns against political correctness, which are intensified for oppressed groups, as she said. But here we have, while the slogan of the movement against sexual violence, no means no, firmly asserts that individual women refuse to be cajoled into sexual experiences they do not want with men. It also suggests that sexual victimisation of women takes place only when consent is, is not given. Defining rape in terms of violation of consent shifts the emphasis of political consciousness from the act of victimisation, the use of sex to exploit, to individual will. It shifts oppression from a class condition of sexual exploitation to individual experiences of it. That is how women in prostitution are excluded from being recognised as sexually victimised. 
So the choice rhetoric really, we know, needs to be challenged further. But I would argue that those who, uh, who um, think they're, everything's hunky-dory and a great choice in, the, in prostitution read this book. And before I, I, I finish off here, money, some more points on money. And I love how you've done it out in note form. Um, and there's only one, one little sentence in part four, savings, LOL, right? And that really hits home for women in the prostitution system. And I don't know that you're going to read this. And as you may have noticed, I'm just reading tiny parts. So I'm not ruining a poem. But my heart, again, every month I handed my rent to a smiling woman in an office with more abstract art who counted the bills and wrote me a receipt. We chatted about fashion and news items and I was quiet, quiet, drunk, with monologues playing in my head only, like how none of those fuckers had ever touched me, not really. I was threadbare, a barely there girl in my soft snow white coat. And you, you want me to come in from what you call the cold? Sure. See how the elevator numbers piano up to number eight, hang a left, then float over fields of blue stars. So uh, with that, I just want to thank you so much, Rose, for placing your experience in these pages and in this book and allowing women's inmost thoughts to be heard. Thank you, bravo. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Simone and to Sally for your wonderful uh, int introductions to this, to this extraordinary book. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing Rose herself. So Rose is the author of six previous books of poetry, as well as um, two, uh, ch two chapbooks. Uh, her poetry has appeared uh, in widely in literary journals in Australia, the USA and Canada. And she's been awarded an Australia Council for the Arts grant for her next book, as I understand. Uh, Rose has always drawn on her own experiences in her poetry, but in the last few years, she has become interested in writing in a clearer way about her history. She's a survivor of the sex industry and intimate partner violence, and she is an alcoholic and addict in recovery. She was born in Armadale in, in, uh, in Australia and raised all over the place. Rose went to live in Canada for 10 years, then Mexico for 10 more. She's currently on the Gold Coast and is enrolled in a PhD in creative writing at Griffith University. And I have to say, Rose, this has been um, such a pleasure to work with you on this book uh, and uh, your editorial skills are truly marvellous. So over to you, Rose. Thank you so much, Susan. I was going to say the same about you. <laughs> um, gosh. Um, Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for being here. Um, thank you to Sally and Simone for your beautiful introductions. Um, yeah, I just am a little bit speechless. Uh, it's, it's more than I was expecting. Um, I so appreciate you engaging with the work as you have um, and for all that you said. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone at Spinifex Press. You've all been brilliant to work with. And I'm so happy that my book found its perfect home with you. Um, there are more people that I'd like to thank here, but I believe Renata will do thank yous at the end. So I'll rely on that as well as um, my thank yous in the back of the book itself in order to move on with what I wanna say here. Uh, I do need to say one special thank you though. Uh, to the editors on my book, Susan, Renata and Pauline, who made great suggestions, including cutting a prologue that didn't need to be there and suggesting instead the addition of an epilogue and saving me from myself when I was trying to re-edit the book at the 11th hour. 
it's true I had quite a bit of anxiety about this book coming out. Speaking of anxiety, I see that there are a few people here who know me very well, which is to say there are a few people here who know how far out of my comfort zone this is talking to you all right now like this. But one thing I'm keeping in mind, which helps enormously with the nervousness I feel, is the fact that I feel this book isn't uh, just about me anymore. I feel that it has an important message and work to do in the world, and I hope it can be of service, whether that means reaching just one person or more people than that. My book stands alongside other writers as well as activists who are working for change, often at significant personal cost. Um, I want to say a few things I think might be important for some people here um, before I read a poem. Um, there may be some of you here who uh, haven't heard much um, about um, being critical of the idea of prostitution. Um, just quickly for those who don't know uh, and not to bore the ones who do, um, prostitution abolition as it's sometimes called in its present form takes the shape of what is known as the Nordic model. In the Nordic model which has been adopted by some countries buying sex is illegal but selling it isn't. In other words the law targets buyers overwhelmingly men as well as pimps and brothels etc. Additionally exit services are put in place for women who do want to get out of the industry. Um, and anyone who's interested in exploring that further can go to the Nordic Model website or ask Simone Watson, the second speaker here tonight, as uh, she works for NORMAC, the Nordic Model Australia Coalition, or read various Spinifex books that have been published on the subject. So as most people here know by now, uh, this book is about the first two years I spent in the sex industry in Canada. This took a variety of forms from massage parlors to brothel to escort to outcall massage. All up, I was in this industry 10 years. I use the general term sex industry as well as prostitution to refer to all these forms. I also use the word men to refer to buyers or johns. As for practical purposes, all my johns were men, as are the majority of johns worldwide. And I refer to women in the sex industry, again, because that is where my experience is situated, uh, as well as the fact that women make up the majority of prostituted people. But I know there are also men and boys who are used and abused by this industry. I want to hear their stories too. People have a variety of stereotypes about women who are or have been in the sex industry. I kept this part of my life secret from most people outside the industry. I knew firsthand how degrading it was, so I knew it was nothing I'd like to mention to others. Added to that was the very real stigma that we face, John's face filer stigma. Since I announced the existence of this book and therefore the existence of this time in my life, since it's a memoir, to all my Facebook friends and others, there have been a variety of different reactions, <laughs> which have sometimes featured these stereotypes. One frequently recurring idea is that I don't fit other people's idea of what a woman in the sex industry is or was. I quit in 2008. I don't look, perhaps, but I think particularly the idea is that I don't act like one or talk like one, etc. How do we talk, perhaps, like we do in Hollywood movies? Whatever the details of these stereotypes are, it seems they do not involve being extremely introverted and quiet and bookish like me. There's a lot I could say, for example, about the stereotype of the empowered sex worker, as well as the crucial issue of who that stereotype serves. But instead, I'm going to go right past the stereotype to the actual type. In my experience, there is one most common, I never say everyone, but overwhelmingly most common type of woman who gets into this industry. And that is really simple. It's a woman who needs the money and a woman who has no other way of getting this money or thinks she has no other way 
or perhaps there is someone who might help her with money, but this help comes with abuse, physical or psychological. There is a choice, but as Simone mentioned as well, and as various other spin effects authors have written about, it is not a choice between two nice or even functional or bearable things. It is somewhat of an impossible choice. So in my opinion and experience, that is the actual type as opposed to the stereotype which is all types, since it isn't a type at all. It's a life situation, an economic situation. It's poverty, or in my case, the present lack of resources. Accordingly, Black, Indigenous and women of colour are overrepresented in this industry. I think many people don't like to look at it that way because it points out clearly that the transactions are inherently exploitative, that prostitution is an exploitative system, whether an individual John is a quote nice guy or not. And many of them are speaking of stereotypes. Overwhelmingly in my experience, they had girlfriends, wives and families. They had good jobs. They went to their kids soccer games. They were mostly not the stereotypical loner ogres that are often imagined. Although interaction with a woman who they do not have to accord full or even partial humanity to can turn a fair number of these nice guys into ogres, at least for half an hour or an hour. But beyond all that, the fact is that prostitution, as I witnessed it and experienced it, takes place between a man who wants sex or whatever sexual service it is and a woman who does not want to do that in most cases, but either wants or needs the money or has become so numb and traumatised that she does not care either way anymore and who is being paid additionally to pretend she wants it. From that basic fact, you can entertain the idea that prostitution as a system, nice guys or not, could be considered paid abuse, paid assault or paid rape. You might ask if this is something that nice guys should do. And you might ask if that system is one you want your society to support in its laws and representations, or whether supporting poor women so they do not have to do this sort of quote work might be a better plan. In my case, I got into the industry for money. I actually came from a middle-class upbringing, but for various reasons, I was not able to take good advantage of that fact. I had spent most of my life since I was a young child crippled by an eating disorder, then later <laughs> experience of unemployability and very low self-esteem. I grew up not thinking, but knowing that I was worthless. That is really fertile ground for getting into this industry. If you believe you're not worth anything, you will let people treat you accordingly. And it doesn't even seem that strange. On the contrary, it seems fitting. It can even seem like home. On that note, I will read you a poem. Uh, I made a decision not to read one of the most confronting poems here. Uh, while I have problems with the popular idea of triggering, specifically it's overused, still I thought a poem about a clear sexual assault, for instance, might be better off approached by readers on their own. Uh, this poem is the first part of the second poem of the book, the one that um, Simone uh, read some parts of. Uh, it's my first John at the massage parlor. I've just arrived in Toronto, uh, Canada from Australia and very quickly I'm unable to pay my rent. I'm determined to stay in the country though for reasons that are mentioned in the poem. As you will hear, I was quite clueless in the beginning. Just in the room, a narrow shelf on the right Rough sawn and splintery caramel with decorative candle with scalloped leaves of holly. Well, it was close to Christmas, but was that this room close to this Christmas or some other? Memory, after all, is a shapeshifter, a memory of a memory of a memory of a could be a shelf from any of the parlors I was in later or lassoed in from some other place to fill those gaps the mind doesn't like. In any case, rough sawn or pearly smooth, holly or some other, a man arrives and the feeling I had was deciding. He looked a bit like my father. 
even though my father was hazel-eyed, not blue, and not then white-haired, and there were no physical similarities actually, other than older, thought I am manufacturing this to make myself feel bad because what I was feeling was a full sort of nothing, repl replete with the other static. The hum of the yellow lights, the soft swishing of the snow fairing traffic on steels. And then I was just in the room and out of it and floating in between. And he was on the table holding up his hands like stop when I went for the light. I want to see you, which gave me the flash of an impression that this was really happening and I was really there. Whereas before I thought maybe watching at the keyhole, another clueless young woman in shapeless skirt and faded black tee, because black was slimming, right? Except this was more like slate gray anyway, or had run away, a child tumbling through the checkerboard tundra, forgot to use the fake name, considered that a faux pas or bad omen or immediate screw up. Then again, that must be more important if you're from here. I mean, if you knew people here that you didn't want finding out. Although how would a fake name help that, I wondered, unless you had an unusual real name. Hmm. So maybe just a way to remind yourself you're an actress, like Blue Suede had said. Another bad omen, I was no good at acting. I thought, I didn't yet know I had some relevant talents. For example, the ability to keep what I was thinking hidden, it was usually wrong. Therefore pause, observe what other people did and said. I had that mind waiting in the wings like that. Near the hinge, nestled against the shoulder muscle, crouched, and in the meantime, smile and nod or laugh. Where a laugh was a twitch toward the idea of a laugh, then stopped. Also knew how running the mind was a way for the body to stay still, stay in the room and that I was worth something in those instances in which I pleased others. A pant leg with, with sock streamer and bills, partially folded lengthwise, open palms, the green grass green of three Canadian twenties. And I remembered what blue suede said I was supposed to do for that. Still, I pulled my t-shirt a hand's length away from my body and tilted my, my head at him in case I had it wrong. Yes, please, he said, smiling as though anticipating a delicious dinner. Huh, really, huh? And how I was right now tumbling through that checkerboard tundra or on a bus on steels, screaming at myself in my head for being such a coward, for running. Back to square, square one and square two, eviction or that plane ticket back to where I'd come from and never wanted to be and missed opportunity in this grand city chock filled with them. I knew I'd be okay here like I wasn't there. The fresh start and how everything will be different in my life from now on. If only I could stay. A cold lake came to mind and how the way was to jump, casting off all objections. As he turned, bit more, bit more, the side of his chin on his upturned hand, his gelled hair crown, pavlova-like, white belly tumbling to rest on the table, other hand on his hip, a misplaced blasé, comedy odalesque or a fleshy sconce, ruddy nose and sweating eyes, lazy smile flickering in the yellow light. I lifted my shirt over my head and stepped out of my skirt like I was in the room alone or like I knew there was someone at the keyhole but ignoring that or like an apology, not sure. My big toe hooked on my underwear coming off, half trip then gazing around where to put them, my cheeks a rising warmth, his face a clearing house of a maze, seashells rattle pulled with the retreat of a wave, eyes adjusting, his jaw actually, literally dropping. I really am your first. And I didn't understand why it was, but understand, understood that it was so good. Thank you all for listening and for being here to welcome my book into the world. Uh, I hope more people will join in considering the idea that prostitution is not something we have to accept as inevitable or okay in our laws, our culture and our popular representations. I know we can treat our women and girls better than this. Over to you, Susan. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, I was reminded reading that, that 
as I was working through the manuscript with you, each time I read it, I was hit by another series of thoughts. And, and it was interesting because the first time through, it was the first section that really hit me. And the second time, it was the second section. By the time I got to the third section, it was really, you know, coming at me. So, you know, you really can read this book at least three times and get new experiences, new insights, new feelings. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing piece of work. So congratulations to you, really. All my, you so all my best wishes. Now, it is possible if, if you would like to, um, for people to make some uh, comments if they want, or Sally, if you would like to read uh, the poem that you were thinking about reading, actually, that would be a really good place to come back to. Okay, I'd love to, and apologies, Rose, if I butcher this, but um, <laughs> I, it, it's a longer one, so I won't, um, I won't read the whole thing. Um, as Susan said, and as I mentioned, um, Susan said it comes at you and I said it grows over you and I feel as if you do get um, submerged in, in so much and some of it's uncomfortable and some of it's um, poignantly beautiful and, um, and then uh, other parts of it are, are, are really sharp and, um, and, and antagonistic and I really love the position in this poem. I'll just start from the middle. And this poem is in the middle section. It's called Why We Are Girls. A girl is younger than you, no matter what age she is. Although obviously it's better if she's actually younger. You are the boss, even as you like to tell her she is. Many of you prefer it that way. Tell her about how empowering all this is for her. She loves it. A girl has no vital functions you need to know about. She's a roadside attraction with heart-shaped shades that reflect your image, sucking on a red lollipop. Or awkward urchin type with acne and hand-me-downs, plain, tattered, or refreshingly unadorned. Yeah, a girl. Naturally, just is whatever you want her to be. Amazing, right? Even when she's not. For those who like a bit of a challenge or the troubled ones, the ones who need rescuing, to all the captain save a hose, or the ones who won't be rescued, the hopeless cases. They're so romantic, dead by the side of the road. You can foam on them. It's just so powerful that that poem rose. Indeed, indeed, it, the the book is filled with powerful poems. Um, if anybody would like to just make a statement, could you please put up your your hand? Um, you can do that in the reactions button button button. <laughs> Um, down uh, on the lower right hand side if you want to say something uh, perhaps I can go back to my question to Rose about um, when I mentioned that strange impulse we might have as writers to mind something that might not be um, very helpful to us um, in terms of self-care or emotionally or or what have you, how did you navigate that? I know there's quite a distance between the time, but could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, sorry for not addressing your question before. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing. Um, for me, uh, sort of in, by the end, I found that the experience became uh, quite therapeutic, but it certainly wasn't um, for a lot of the writing. Mm -hmm. And um, often uh, the first draft, I, I would have a feeling of, um, uh, yeah, getting some, some trauma. 
without having an insight and all those nice things. Uh, but then you have to edit it and, and make it into something good. <laughs> and then you go, you go over and over and over it again. And uh, that can be uh, really re-traumatizing, I think. Um, so I did find that in the writing. Um, and I think, you know, uh, probably I, I'm a bit of a maniac in how I approach it. And I just sort of keep going anyway. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, it's an interesting thing because, uh, as as you said uh, really beautifully in your introduction, and thank you so much. Um, I was trying to produce uh, a piece of art. I wasn't. I realized uh, by the end that I had also produced something with a, with a message, you know, but I didn't start with that. Um, I just started with a floating idea that um, I wanted to uh, get these things down and it was important for some reason. And I had lots of failed attempts as well. And I think I did it the wrong way. Like, yeah, every single wrong way you can imagine <laughs> first. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, but I think, you know, uh, trauma, um, it's, uh, it's one of those things that for me, it makes me want to write about it because it, it, um, it sticks with me and, and the, the way that uh, I get it out is through writing. I don't recommend that uh, widely, you know. Um, I know various studies have proved that the, um, uh, the effectiveness of, of using certain uh, timed periods of writing to uh, get trauma out. Right. Um, but I'm sure none of them go back over and over and over and over this material. So, um, uh, yeah, if that answers your question a bit. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a curious duality, isn't it? Um, knowing that that you're drawing on something that that is potentially triggering or and I too have problems with that word but mm. the dredging of, of of things that might be confronting to yourself but of course in it we know that writing what you dare not say means you're possibly onto something you know and 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 onto something for the audience um and someone has to be brave enough to go down that path you know for us readers I I guess yeah um yeah thank you uh for that yeah i um had something in my head but it just has flown out <laughs> yeah. i also wanted to ask you um uh, a few people have mentioned um i guess what i would term a filmic quality to the way that you construct an image uh, it's sort um, I think Susan mentioned rooms. It's it's very scenic or filmic in the way that it's composed. Are you um, very influenced by film? I am, uh, or I was, and particularly in that time period. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, in the book, I'm a failed film student. <laughs> or I, I uh, actually I didn't fail, but I did not finish. We'll put it that way. Um, and, and that was really my first love. What I wanted to do was work in film. So maybe that um, translates into a uh, very visual sense, but I know um, a lot of um, poets, but a lot of writers in, in general have the same thing. But um, I did think a lot about film at certain points of constructing this, particularly with uh, dialogue, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I thought about film dialogue and how that moves. Um, and I also wanted to make this way more narrative than anything that I'd written before. I wanted people to know what the story was and what was happening and all these things that um, are sort of difficult to do in, in poetry uh, to keep that moving along. So, um, yeah, I think I thought of film quite a bit in this. Mm. Great, um, thank you. There are a number of comments in the chat uh, from people who are saying congratulations to you, uh, including a survivor who says that um, 
it, it, the poem that you read made me laugh and cry at the similarities to my memories and experiences. So, um, yeah, there are lots of congratulations in, in the chat. Simone, did you want to add anything at this stage? Oh, yeah, I want to add a million things, but I probably shouldn't because we'll be here. But I don't know, you just have these turns of phrase that, that resonate. And But, you know, I'll, I'll love you forever for just saying, you know, money smells like rent perfume. It's just it's so evocative. Like, again, there's that humour, but it's tragic. It is. It, it's, it smells like your rent coming. It's rent it, it, that... That it is Thank you so much, Simone. I wanted to comment too. That I really I like that you commented on the humor in the book because um, I sort of I see the humor in it, but sometimes I wonder if uh, I have a strange sense of humor, you know. <laughs> so I wasn't sure yeah. if, if other readers would pick up on it, but yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, look, I, I just thought, oh, well, if, if maybe perhaps if you haven't been in the system and because like this was a brutal book, you can't be, there's no other way to put it, isn't it? It's sort of like it's poetry and then it's a sledgehammer and it's confronting and it's incredible. But I mean, you have to. But I, I, I also think that it's possible that some people may not want to talk about it being funny because the issue is so serious, whereas I kind of feel a bit like I had to say how I responded to that situation because it's all so awful. I mean, and, and the, what happened before and after is, of course, terrible. But in that moment, I was just like laughing at the ridiculous quality of it. And, um, yeah, I... I really appreciate that you could that you could do that. That's just brilliant. Thank you. So okay, thank you, thank you for every to everybody. And I think Renata um, will do some thank yous, and then we'll wind up. Um, yes, indeed, I do want to do some thank yous. And my first thank yous, thank you, big big thank you, obviously goes to Rose. Now, I'm not the poet in this. Um, it is Spinifex House, it's Susan, and also Pauline Hopkins, who I think is here, who is very good at editing um, poetry. But Susan kept coming and saying, you have to read this, you have to read this. And so I thought, all right, I'll have to read this. And I started and I was immediately drawn into it. I was just absolutely mesmerized. And as Simon just said, it is actually a brutal book. It truly is a brutal book, as it should be, because the sex industry is a brutal industry profiting from women's and girls' bodies, and yes, some men too. But you manage somehow through the choice, and in this case, it's, it's a good use of the word choice, to the choice of your words that are really wonderfully um, chosen to not only um, make these awful situations come alive, but also, I don't want to say embellish them because that's not what you do, but because your writing is so beautiful, it also gives it a quality of, to the reader that yes, um, it, all, it is awful, but we can endure it as we must, because we must learn about this industry. And it is endurable because also of the quality of your writing. I don't know if this makes sense, but I was totally drawn into it. And I really, really, I think I finished it in one reading, which I normally or very rarely do with other poetry books where I need to, you know, put them down and do something else. But yours really kept me reading. And interestingly enough, and I mean, Susan said that was her first impression but then you changed interestingly enough it was really the first section about the massage parlors that i only read it once that um for me uh was just the the most uh devastating one in some way and i still don't quite understand why that is because you think well you quote graduated from massage parlors to you know in brussels um, but the massage parlors were unbelievably um, bad, but expressed by you in such a way, um, as I said, it was bearable to read. And 
because your writing is so beautiful. It was like you could we could read it, and it, it did not trigger me. So now I think Sally said before um, the use of the word trigger um, <laughs> is really very debatable. I mean, the world triggers us. So, um, but I did not feel your book was triggering because it's not what's the word titillating. It was it's never titillating. It's not exoticizing. Um, it is a very um, high end, that's a, a terminology, high end writing literature book. That's a very, very bad sentence. I would be edited out for that sentence. <laughs> you know what I mean? It really is actually um, an incredibly ac accomplished book. And I'm not surprised that you have already six books already that you wrote before that. And I, I look forward to your PhD, which I'm sure is going to be very interesting to read. Uh, then Sally, I also really wanted to thank you for your very wonderful words and your endorsement and everything. It really means a lot, not just to Rose, but to all of us at Spinifex. And of course, the same for Simon, a very wonderful friend of ours and long-term a uh, very strong activist for um, the Nordic model and anyway, for women in general. And Simone does not take, uh, does not like fools. What's the expression does not take, does not suffer fools gladly. And I'm there with you on that. And uh, we've had many good moments, even despite the fact that the topics of when we met, you know, have always been really difficult. The other thing I wanted to say, this is obviously not the first book that Spinifex has been doing um, on prostitution. The other book that I was just referring to when we had a very big launch in Melbourne a few years ago and Simon and the editors, um, Melinda Tanker-Driest and Carolyn Norma were there as well and many others um, was the prostitution narratives. And I think you have a copy there, Susan, don't you? And actually Simon has, um, Simon has a, her story in that book as well. And I think when, during, it was a conference at which we launched a book. And I think there were also many cry, many, many eyes, you know, that uh, did not remain, rem, remain dry during that day. Um, I think it is important that we um, we cry with the women who have been through the horrors of the sex industry, but we also can laugh at some of the moments that were just too bizarre in a way, that they were actually funny. And I think I'm really sure that that helped you to survive, to survive it all. But I think... Well, just speaking of something funny, Renata, I remember when the pro-sex trade lobby got lost at that book launch and they were they found an anonymous patch of grass and got there with their pro-sex trade signs and posted photographs on Twitter and pretended to be at the conference, I think, and that was tragic funny. <laughs> yes, it, that was so bad that um, when the book, when the word got out that we would have a conference and launch this book, uh, we got very serious, serious attacks from the from the, the so-called sex industry lobbyists and the sex work um, people. And as Simone just said, <laughs> some very clever women, of which I was not one, uh, made it possible that they also we would be meeting in a, in a different place. And meanwhile, we were totally somewhere else and they all gathered and then had these photos taken. That was really, really hilarious. Um, and I think they didn't come in. We must have had security at the conference, which is really terrible, isn't it? That when you have a conference uh, on, uh, on, on the negative aspects of, of prostitution, um, you have to have security guards so that your speakers won't uh, be accosted, as happened at another conference, actually. So, but I probably shouldn't be uh, taking much more time up on this um, other than, again, thanking Rose very, very much for that incredible book that you have written, Sally for her comments, um, Simone also for her comments. And I just want to now uh, briefly uh, really thank the Spinifex team apart from Susan and also Pauline Hopkins, who was the other main editor. I just came in 
sort of as the sidekick. <laughs> um, but they did manage to, you know, talk you out of the prologue, which is a good thing, I think. And it has now, the book now has an epilogue. Um, the book is, uh, as I think, Simon, can you just hold it up again? For those of you who haven't got their copies yet, it is, I think, one of the most beautiful books that we have ever produced. And the beautiful cover was done by um, Deb Snipson, who does all of our covers. And I, I think you, she got a brief from you, either from, I can't remember, from Rose or from Susan or both of you or Pauline. And it is really, it's a mesmerizing cover. And um, it will really, um, make, it sings, it just sings. So yes, the whole thing is horrible, but it's also very beautiful, I mean, to um, talk about it in, in those beautiful words. Uh, then when you open the book, you see it is set out with a lot of care and poetry, uh, setting poetry, typesetting poetry is, is an art. And Helen Christie, who also typesets all our books, uh, is an artist and she has done an exceptional uh, job, I think, in <clears throat> making this book just look really be beautiful. So beautiful outside, beautiful inside. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, there's other people at Spinifex, and um, we have Caitlin Roper, who is here, but she just disappeared, who is our social media person and spreads the news on the book. And um, Rachel McDermott, who has not disappeared and does all the right things so that we actually do have <laughs> proper videos and recordings and we can't do it without her. We always make boo boo so and I. So thank you very much, Rachel, for all your work. And of course, more work that you will do to get this book out to readers. Um, then uh, we have Marilyn Damiano, who is our office manager, who is also here um, and who sends the books out together with Sharon Murphy, who uh, is the warehouse manager. So thank you, both of you, for uh, all your work. I think, have I forgotten anybody? No. Yes, I would just like to mention um, the other person on the back cover is uh, Sherry Smiley uh, oh, yeah. from Canada. Uh, and she is a member of Nalaka Pamuks and Dino Nations and the founder of Women's Studies Online Canada. And she's a, a wonderful woman and it's great to have a, an endorsement from Sherry Smiley as well. And we will actually be publishing Sherry's, it's her PhD, so we have to whittle it down to some publishable uh, links, but we will be publishing her PhD, which is a radical feminist uh, analysis of what, why people and some, you know, even colored people are doing to the whole idea and the reality of indigenous women in Canada. It's a very, very um, incisive and very necessary analysis. And it has a good title, which I now have forgotten. It says something about from not a score, not a- Not sacred, not scores. Yeah, that's right. So that will come much later in the year. So, Unless somebody else still has to say something, Rose, you would have to you have the, the last words. Um, if you want to have the last words, otherwise I'm very happy to end proceedings and hope you will all get the book and uh, recommend it to your friends. And do we have a slide that shows where you can buy them? I'm about to share the screen, so here you go. Okay. Now, before you do that, Rose, did you want to say some last words, final last words? Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, everyone so much and thank you for um, for speaking, Sally and Simone. And, and um, yeah, it was just uh, wonderful, um, all the things you said, and it's been wonderful working with Spin Effects. And thank you to everyone who joined in some uh, time zones that were not very... Um, <laughs> conducive to being here so thank you to those people as well so if you are in Australia then you can get a free post if you mention that word free post in your order uh, and you can order our books 
overseas in North America, that's Canada, USA and Mexico, through that website there, ipgbook.com, and in the UK and Europe through Gazelle Book Services. So thank you very, very much uh, to everybody, uh, to Simone and to Sally and to Rose particularly, uh, and also to all of you coming along tonight. The, um, the, it will be, the recording will be up on YouTube uh, in a few days' time. It usually takes a day or two for that to happen. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's been lovely to have you here. Thanks, Susan. Thank you.